Well, welcome back. In our last video, we talked about bone classification uh, in regards to bone location as well as bone shape. But there are different ways to classify, other ways to classify a bone. And what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about uh, classifying bone according to structure and how the bone is structured. Uh, and so let's talk on, let's head that and talk about that. First of all, when we look at a bone, and this is looking at, again, a long bone. We talked about long bones a little bit before. So here's a long bone, okay? So we have a long bone, okay? And the long bone um, has multiple different parts to it. And we're going to go through each of these, the diaphysis, the epiphysis, the epiphyseal plate, the metaphysis, the articular cartilage, the periosteum, the medullary cavity, the endosteum. So we'll, we'll describe each of these and what each of these means. So let's go ahead and get started with that because we have a lot to talk about. Um, when we talk about that. First of all, let's talk about the diaphysis, okay? And the diaphysis is basically the area or the shaft of the bone, okay? So this arrow so sure shows where that diaphysis is. So we start about here down to about there. And basically, it's the long cylindrical portion of the bone, very the, the more tubular portion of the bone, okay? It's the main form or the main part of most long bones. The majority of long bones, they're mostly diaphyseal bone, okay? And what we see at the diaphyseal bone, if you look here at this diagram, you see the outside has a cortical rim around the outside, that soup bone-like appearance that we see is cortical on the outside, uh, or that's that cortical, that compact, that dense bone that's on the on the outside as the outer shell. But inside, while this looks sort of empty, it's really not empty. That's filled with that cancellous bone, that bone marrow type stuff on the inside. And that's what we see in the diaphysis. So from here to here, basically the shaft area of the bone, it's that cortical uh, rim around the outside, you know, filled inside with that, with that um, with that more of that spongy bone on the inside, okay? And that's what we see with the diaphysis. The next portion of the bone we have is called the epiphysis. And the epiphysis is the end of the bone. So now we're looking up in here, and we're looking down in here. So we have the, the diaphysis in the middle, the shaft, and the epiphysis. Epi means upon, okay? Physis, by the way, means growth. It means growth, okay? Physis means growth. Okay, and basically the epiphysis means upon the area of growth. We'll talk about the growth plate, which is going to be this area right here, and that's so this area right here is upon the area of growth. Okay, that's like the word epiphysis. It's the the proximal and distal ends of a long bone. And hopefully you remember all those proximal, distal, medial, and lateral words that we talked about before, which we told you you really need to know. But anyway, it's the proximal and distal ends of a bone. So we both have we have. We have the epiphysis down here, and we have an epiphysis at this point, okay? When I look at the epiphysis, we've gone through that change where instead of having a real thick, uh, compact, you know, cortical bone like we saw in the diaphysis, the compact or cortical bone starts to thin out, becomes much thinner as I get into the area of the epiphysis. It starts to thin out. And what happens is we have a very thin cortical shell around the outside of it right here. And all that inner portion right there is filled up with more of that softer, that cancellous bone on the inside, that spongy bone on the inside, okay? And that's what we see at the epiphysis. It's still very strong because again, the alignment of all these little cancellous bone struts in there, they provide con considerable strength to the end. But that's the epiphysis. The epiphysis is the end of the bone, both a proximal distal end, mostly a very thin cortical shell around the outside, filled with more cancellous bone. And on the tip of it, and if I just take away and take what we've what we've drawn up up in here, on the tip of it, on the end of it, is where we're going to have what's called our articular cartilage. The cartilage is going to make uh, contact with the adjacent bone to it. And we'll talk a little about that in a minute. Okay. Now metaphysis is the next portion of the bone we want to talk about. And basically is this the metaphysis, we see the metaphysis here and a metaphysis here. And that's where the bone is transitioning from being a diaphyseal bone in here to an epiphyseal bone. And what's going to happen is, again, in that diaphysis, we have a lot of very thick cortical rim around the bone. It's going to start to get thinner in the metaphysis. So there's two things that we see in the metaphysis. We start to see a change in the composition of the bone going from a thick cortical shell on the outside to becoming progressively thinner as it's going towards the epiphysis. So therefore, it's getting thinner and thinner in this area right here and here, where which means that this area is starting to fill up with more and more and more cancellous bone, okay, that softer, spongier bone. We also know that this is the place where the bone usually flares out. There's going to be a flare. So it flares out, you know, in both directions this way, it flares out this way and flares out this way. So that's what we see in the metaphysis. So the metaphysis meta means change or transition or after. And what happens is um, 
this is where the bone is transitioning from being uh, that diaphyseal bone, very thick cortical tubular bone with a cancellous core up the center of it to where it's starting to flare out, change in both shape as well as consistency. The cortical bone is getting thinner, cancellous bone is filling that area more. Okay, And that's what we see in the area of the bone called the metaphysis. Okay, So now we've, you know, we know the, the, the diaphysis, we know the epiphysis, and now we know the metaphysis. Okay? Those things are important. Okay, uh, A couple of things I should mention about this too is if I look at the diaphysis, you know, if I look at the diaphyseal region, the blood supply in this area is not all that great. There's a large artery that comes in in one area, and that's called the nutrient artery. So here's a nutrient artery that comes in. It comes in sometimes one, sometimes a couple different spots along the diaphysis of the bone. But what happens is the bone up here, because it's cancellous, uh, there's, uh, uh, there's spaces between all those little spikes of bone. Those little spikes are called trabeculi that will be in there little spikes they're all called trabeculi and the gaps between that are filled with that marrow material but it's also very bloody bone okay it's very bloody bone a couple things that we mentioned before about bone healing in the integument portion is that the greater the blood supply the greater the potential for healing so therefore if somebody gets a fracture in this area in the diaphysis healing times are very long and they're really long why because the blood supply is not really good if i have a fracture or if they do surgery in the area of the metaphysis or diaphysis because the blood supply is good the bone is very bloody healing times are rapid i know that when we did a bone procedure we prefer to do it in the metaphyseal region in most cases simply because it was good healing bone it was very bloody bone that had a good blood supply to it and therefore that prompted healing a lot better that's just a little offhand thing that i should mention here while we're talking talking about diaphysis versus metaphysis versus epiphysis. Now, I mentioned at the end of a bone, we have what's called the articular cartilage, okay? And this is that hyaline cartilage that we talked about earlier in the, in the tissue section. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, um, an area at the end of the bone that has this cartilage. And that cartilage serves a couple purposes, okay? Uh, first of all, it, it also, it's, it's a little bit compressive. It's a little sort of, sort of like uh, grizzly-like. Sometimes if you bite into a bad hamburger and you bite down, you get that grizzly thing inside there. And you say, oh, jeez, you know what? That hamburger is going in the garbage now. It just sort of turns your stomach a little bit. That's sometimes when they chip off the meat off the bone, they actually chip off a little piece of cartilage, and the cartilage gets caught inside there. Okay. Uh, but so, so what it is, it's sort of like a little compressive. So it does comp provide a little bit of a shock absorption. But what it's really important for is that the surface of the articular cartilage we see here is sort of like in a blue gray at the end. The, the, the surface is smooth. Okay. And that smooth surface allows that if I have two opposing smooth surfaces, they slide along each other a lot better. Now the inside the joint, when you get to when we talk when you get to some some uh, videos in regards to the joint, there'll be a joint capsule and these joints then this capsule has tissue inside that makes a very slippery fluid which is called synovial fluid. And that synovial fluid covers the surface of the articular cards on one side as well as the other side, which makes it even slipperier. Okay, when people have an osteoarthritis or this wear and tear arthritis, which happens to everybody when they get old, I know you're all looking at me strange right now, saying, "Yeah, you know, osteoarthritis." Yeah, I probably do. Okay, but when and when you get older and you start to lose that cartilage, what happens? The cartilage gets thinner and thinner and becomes more rough, and as a result, that's what causes the problems in regards to the changing in, in joint motion, as well as sometimes discomfort that occur in people when they get this osteoarthritis, because the bone then tries to make up for it, and it's just never as good as the cartilage. Okay. Um, couple things about the cartilage okay and we talked about this in the tissues if you remember back at that point you got to remember that what happens is the blood supply to cartilage is what bad so did, how is the heart is the cartilage going to heal it doesn't the cartilage doesn't heal a whole lot it lacks what's called a perichondrium and that perichondrium would have cells in it that would actually uh, force regeneration of cartilage, but it doesn't have a perichondrium and therefore it has a very uh, poor blood supply so when somebody injures, damages, or wears away the cartilage, there's not a whole lot of recourse. You know, it's gone. That's why you'll see a whole lot of hip replacements and knee replacements because what happens is when the cartilage is gone, you can't take a magic medicine to make it come better, back somewhere uh, and make it better. Um, uh, some people will get injections inside there and the injection basically takes a cartilage that's being worn away, but still by they inject almost like an oily-like material, synvis, chialgin, a couple things like that, and they stick it inside the joint and it covers the joint so it gets slippery and sometimes it works okay and sometimes it doesn't. The lifespan is only a few months if it does 
those work, and then you have to get another injection inside the joint to put that slippery fluid inside the joint. Okay, so those things, but it, but the, but the cartilage, the bad part is it lacks regenerative capacity. It can't it can't heal itself. Okay, once it has it's damaged or torn or ripped or or worn away. Okay, it's gone. Once it's gone, it's gone. Um, there are some things that they have now that they may be able to use stem cells to be able to help this. They're actually able to take some uh, stem cells from um, a bone. Okay, they can harvest them in certain areas and they put it into like a mix and they make it a gel and they pack a hole of the cartilage with this gel. And it's able to actually possibly regenerate some cartilage inside there, which is actually good. And if you ever heard of things, uh, uh, microfracture surgery, you know, you might wonder what's microfracture surgery. What happens in microfracture surgery is people who have a joint injury with the cartilage, the articular cartilage, articular again means joint. Okay, when they have the microfracture surgery, if they have a defect, in the cartilage, what they actually do is they go inside the joint surgically and they drill holes through the cartilage. Okay, you say no, it's going to damage it. Yes and no. What it does, they drill it down into the um, the the cancellous bone below the cartilage. Okay, let me just get rid of all that up there. Let me just get this get rid of this. Think about this. If we take a if we take a drill, okay, take a drill, very small little drill bit, and drill holes down this way through the cartilage. And into the cancellous bone. What do they say about the cancellous bone? It's bloody. So all those little holes fill with blood and that little blood forms a clot and that little clot then may turn into something called fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage. There we go. We find it in the screen. Fibrocartilage, which is not as good as hyaline cartilage, but is better than nothing at all. And that's to do with microfracture surgery. Uh, sometimes it works, and sometimes it, it doesn't work very well. Okay. And they're just trying to replace the cartilage, the articular cartilage that's been lost by injury or trauma or damage or something like that, with some other type of connective tissue, uh, fibrocartilage, which not is not as good, but still could be better than nothing at all. Okay. But that's the articular cartilage. The medullary cavity. The medullary cavity is that core uh, we talk about in the area of the diaphysis. Okay, so again, there's the diaphysis. As we all know right now, there's the diaphysis. And while it looks empty there, it's not. That whole area is filled with cancellous bone. That's soft. I can't, oh, I don't say soft. Don't say soft. Every time I say soft, I want to want to take my scissors here and you know, you know poke an eye out or something like that. Okay, I won't because I won't be able to see what I'm pointing at. I won't be able to draw on the screen. By the way, what happens is it's not. It's it's that 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 spongy uh, cancellous bone that fits fills the inside of this marrow cavity okay most of it in adult is this yellow marrow it's mostly filled with the little gaps in between are filled with um, <clears throat> with uh, with fat okay more than anything so that's that usually that yellow marrow in that uh, area of the medullary ca cavity so that's called the medullary cavity and it's right down that tubular center portion which isn't open but filled with that cancellous bone hopefully you understand what that's all about okay Bone growth. Now, this is something I want to talk about very briefly, and we could go into, I could probably sit here and talk for about an hour. I'm sure you could probably fall asleep or have to go to the bathroom before then. You'd get up and you'd leave and you don't know where you came, where, you, where, you, where you'd come back. But what happens is bone grows. Long bone only grows in length at the ends of the long bone. And at the ends of the long bone, they have a growth plate. Okay. <clears throat> These growth plate is what happens. It's a, it's a modified type of cartilage. <clears throat> we mentioned this in tissue before. In that, in that growth plate, it's a modified form of cartilage, and this modified cartilage goes through multiple layers. It goes through multiple layers with basically a resting layer of cartilage that becomes that starts to proliferate. We start have the cells to start to start to multiply, and they start to divide. So of so they 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 keep on duplicating themselves. Then what happens? These cells get bigger. And as they get bigger, they go through this transitional phase to where eventually they become calcified. And calcified mean, means they become bone. So we, we, gradually lay, we, we gra gradually start to lay down layer after layer of bone. As we do that, the bone gets longer and longer, but only at the ends of the bone. The bone doesn't get longer in this area. Okay, The bone may get wider circumferentially, but doesn't get longer in the middle. It only gets longer in the areas where we call the growth plates or where they call the epiphyseal plates or physis. Physis, again, like I mentioned before, means growth. Epiphyseal plate, epi upon physis, epi upon the area of growth. And as a result, um, that's the only place bone grows uh, in length at, okay? Uh, which is by, uh, just out of your curiosity, is probably the weakest in, in growing bone. This occurs, and these, these growth plates will actually fuse at a certain time when you get to a, uh, the, the maximal portion 
our growth. They'll actually fuse, okay? And so we can actually almost predict a level of growth at a certain point. If the growth plates are real wide, it means there's a lot of growing left to do. If the growth plates on radiographs are very narrow, it means that their, their time of growing is, is coming to a close. It's going to be, it's going to be relatively soon. Uh, so I could actually look at that. Also, it's the weakest point because the cartilage in growing bone is weaker than the bone itself. So a lot of times people, younger kids, when they fracture the, when they have a fracture or an injury to bone, okay, as a younger kid, it doesn't, doesn't break the bone, but actually breaks through the growth plate. So we'll actually have a fracture that goes right through the growth plate. And uh, th th there's good news and bad news about that. First of all, it goes through the growth plate. So there's always a possibility it might damage some of those growth plate cells that are in there. But the good news is that usually doesn't happen. And the good news is these heal relative, really fast. Usually about, you know, a kid falls down. I've seen situations where a kid will come into the emergency room, fell out of a tree, and his hand is hanging down from his arm like at 90 degrees, okay? And mom's all freaked out and she needs her Valium and stuff like that. And she's going crazy because, oh, my son will never play the piano again and stuff like that. And on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And, and you'll say, and you'll, you'll say oh, don't worry about it. All, all they do is they pop it back into where it's supposed to be, stick them in a, a, frequently a splint, not even a, a full cast. Stick them in a splint, and in three to four weeks, they're ready to fall out of another tree. Uh, it heals that fast. Why? Because these cartilage cells in here in this growth plate, okay, they're very rapidly proliferating. There's a, a really rapid growth of these cells. So these heal relatively fast. Within about four weeks, they're probably back to normal. I probably wouldn't have climb trees for about like six weeks, but you know, you don't want to have too many insurance claims. Otherwise, they're talking about child abuse and stuff like that. So anyway, I do that. So and, and when, so that's what we call the, the, the epiphyseal or the growth plate. And so these are, again, are metabolically active cells. Okay, we show one up in here on this side. There will be one on this side down here, right between the metaphysis and the epiphysis. They are the gap and they are that line, that dividing line between the epiphysis on the outside, the growth plate and the metaphysis. So they're between that. So they're between the epiphysis and the metaphysis. Again, very metabolically, exceptionally active cells. This is the area of the longitudinal bone growth, like I mentioned, in kids and adolescents. And again, once those fuse, and, and actually in an adult, in an adult, you won't see a, a, a line through there, like a dark line. Uh, again, if we look at radiographs, things that are white are denser. Things that are darker are not as dense, okay? So if the cartilage is not as dense as bone, the area where that growth plate is in kids is going to be grayer, okay? The area of the bone is going to be whiter, okay? Uh, so as a result, what happens is once that uh, it fuses in adults, sometimes what we'll actually see, instead of a gray line between, we'll actually see a very white line across the bone. It's, it's, it's wider than the rest of the bone. It also looks like that. So you can always see the remnant of where the growth plate was in adults, okay? But when that, when that growth plate fuses, that epiphyseal plate fuses, there's no further longitudinal bone growth, okay? And again, it becomes what's called the epiphyseal line, which is most likely, and not always, but frequently seen as like a wider a wider line on the on a radiograph, okay, where, where the growth plate closed. The periosteum. Peri means around, osteo means bone. And around the bone, there's a membrane. There's a, a very dense membrane that covers around bone. It's a tough, dense membrane that covers around the bone, as is shown here. Basically, on this diagram, it only shows this little tab of the stuff sitting up right there, okay? But it's covering all the bone. The only place it doesn't cover is over the articular cartilage. So it's a no over the articular cartilage, no over the articular cartilage, it's not there. But everywhere else in the bone, it, it covers, okay? And um, so, it, it, and what happens is this, 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 um, this periosteum, okay, is osteoprogenitor. Now, we talked about this word before. Osteoprogenitor means it's capable of forming bone, okay? It's very important in regards to bone healing. And what this does is this, this periosteum or this membrane that surrounds the bone actually allows the bone to grow circumferentially in width, okay? So it increases, whoops, increases, that's not going to work, okay? It increases width, of the bone. So it's starting to get wider and wider around the outside because of that periosteum. So it allows the bone growth to grow in diameter or in thickness. Also, it's vital in, frac in fracture repair. I remember when I did my residency, we used to always, when we get down to the bone, we had taken, we make a, a knife and cut into the bone and stick a little thing called a periosteal elevator, which looked like a little spatula underneath it and pry the periosteum up off the bone and rip it off the bone, make a bone cut with a saw or whatever we're using, okay? And then take the periosteum 
after it was done, after we put a pin, screw, plates, wires, whatever in, held the bone together, take the periosteum and put it on the top. Nowadays, they realize that what we did probably at that point, which was acceptable uh, uh, pr procedure, is probably not the best thing, simply because we may be damaging the periosteum as I pry it off the bone. So now times what they do is they just go down the bone, they cut right through the periosteum. They, they actually, well, it's interesting, if you ever seen any orthopedic surgery, when you cut bone with a saw, the saw is actually, you know, the saw blade is moving back and forth really fast. It causes friction. That friction causes heat, which burns, okay, which burns the bone. So a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see an assistant there with a little syringe with a little, little saline on there, and they drip the saline on the blade as the bone is being cut. And as a result, that sort of like cools the blade so it, the, the blade doesn't burn burn the periosteum because the periosteum is really more, at that point, very important, as important as the bone, okay? So this is vital and fracture repair. When we see, if you've ever had a stress fracture, what you actually see is in a stress fracture, you actually see the periosteum build up in layers. On the outside, the bone will actually have, start to get a bump on it as the periosteum becomes inflamed. And, it, and you'll actually see in stress fractures, you won't really see a crack across the bone, but you'll actually see the, the, the periosteum on an x-ray getting thicker and thicker and thicker. It looks like a bump on the outside of the bone, okay? Uh, also, that periosteum assists the bone in, in, in bone nourishment. There are little fibers, and you don't have to remember this. There's little fibers that connect the periosteum to the bone. They're called Sharpies fibers. And these Sharpies fibers have both neurological and vascular components to it to allow uh, a good vascular supply to the outside of the bone, okay? So it assists in the bone nourishment and also what happens is because that periosteum is usually firmly attached to the bone by these sharpies fibers tendons and ligaments can actually blend with the periosteum so it creates a nice attachment of the a tendon or ligament to the bone tendons again attaching muscle to bone and ligaments attaching bone to bone and it, it makes a firm attachment because now periosteum has all these little sharpies fibers that actually attach it and glue it to the surface of the bone so that's also very important so we try to leave the periosteum alone if we if we can't bother with it. You'll see in some tumors, in some tumors what happens, it causes the bone to try to change in shape. When it causes a change in shape, actually the periosteum starts to get thicker in some cases, which might be an indicator. Hey, I think we better look at that because it looks like there's some type of a tumor or something like going on. You can see this little bump on the outside of the bone. Which, and it's easy. To, it's sort of, I'll, I'll show you some examples, hopefully radiographically. You'll see the edge of the bone and all of a sudden you'll see a little bit of a grayer shadow on the outside, okay? It's not quite the same, it's not quite the white you'd see in the bone, but you see a little bit of a grayer shadow and it comes up on the on the bone like that. And that's called a callus. So here they have a bone callus. That's it. it. Bone callus is basically a periosteal reaction that occurs. Now, if I have periosteum on the outside, on the inside of that endosteal canal, I also have what's called endosteum. We also have osteoprogenitor cells on the inside that work very similar as the periosteum on the outside. So as the bone is getting getting wider, I, I need to actually continue to change the bone on the inside, okay? So that endosteum is a thin membrane layer that's on the inside. One thing I should also mention about the periosteum is next time you have like a chicken bone, okay, or something like that, uh, if you actually take it and take a very sharp knife and you score the, the bone, you can actually see where that periosteum will actually come off the bone. You can actually see her sort of peel it off just a little bit, just for the, if you if you have, if you like to play around with your food before it's, before it's cooked, okay? So I'm sure that people will say, hey, leave my food alone. Don't fool around with it like that. So that's the endosteum. It's on the inside, okay, inside of the bone, like okay, the periosteum. Now, that tells you a little about the different parts of a bone. Now, these are going to be, those are important words, okay? If someone might get, might order an extra and say, uh, they're concerned about something in the diaphyseal region, you got to know immediately, 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 not like looking it up and figuring it out later on, you know, that diaphyseal is that long shaft portion of a tubular, long tubular bone, okay? If they say they think that they have an epiphyseal plate fracture, you make sure that, that the radiographs are, are, are looking at the area where the epiphyseal plate is. So these are actually exceptionally critical words, just like the proximal, distal, medial, lateral, anterior, posterior, ventral, dorsal, blah, 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 contralateral, ipsilateral, all those words we talked about before. These are, are words that you got to know. They're, they're, they're basic. Um, it's not like above and beyond, like only the, only the better x-ray techs know this. No, all, everybody should know these things, okay? One other thing I want to discuss in this video are what we call surface markings, okay? And surface markings 
our various uh, structural features that we see in the bone, various structural features, like features okay? And these, these structural features have specific functions, okay? A lot of times they develop after birth in response to forces. When you take an x-ray of a, of a baby, okay, you'll look and say, oh my gosh, where are all his bones? Mom's all freaking out again, you know? Probably your kid just fell out of the tree and had an epiphyseal prey fracture, and then she brings the baby in the next day and say, where are my kid's bones? They're all gone. Well, guess what? They're a cartilage shell. We'll talk about that in our next video, okay, how the, the bone will actually ossify. But what happens is sometimes these lumps and bumps on a bone, if you look at a bone, a bone is not like a piece, piece, piece of PVC pipe. It's not just like a tube. There are lumps and bumps and grooves and troughs and, and crests and all kinds of things on these bones, and they're all for a specific reason. And some of these things will actually develop later on down the road. They might meet, not be there immediately, but they will develop after birth in response to various forces or pressures that are placed on the bone that are naturally supposed to be there. They're free Frequently at the site of a muscle, tendon, fascia, ligament attachment, and stuff like that, and, and where they pull on that periosteum, like I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And as a result, what happens is that stress on the bone and the periosteum, what does the periosteum do? Has osteoprogenitor capabilities, so a new bone gets deposited where that pull might be on the area of the bone where these lendon, the tendon, ligament, muscle, fascia, whatever attaches to the bone, and therefore new bone is formed as a little bump or something like that. These are frequently roughened or heightened areas, or we have compression areas, which actually are areas that look depressed in the bone. And these all have a specific name, and I think we need to know those names as terms as well. Okay, And that's what we're going to head on next. Now we have two types of surface markings, and this is pretty simple. This is not rocket science to figure this out. We have depressions or openings. Those are things that are cut out or holes, okay? We also have processes. Processes are basically lumps and bumps on things, okay? So, and we have a, a bunch of different types of these. So these, th this is just where we start. Guess what? The, we've, we've just opened the door here. There are a number of these things we have to think about, okay? Now, what are depressions or openings, okay? Again, these are either like gaps or a trough in a bone. If a bone, if let's say a bone was like... Uh, like like this, okay. Sometimes you'll have a little uh, another part of the bone that will have a little trough in it, you know. Well, what's that trough for? Sometimes a tendon runs through it. Sometimes we'll have a bone and there'll be a hole inside the bone. What goes? Something's going to go through it. If we look at the skull, the skull is just absolutely 100% loaded. Not 100%. You know, I'm, I'm, that's an exaggeration, a big exaggeration. But it has tons and tons of small little holes. And guess what goes through those? Blood vessels, nerves, things like that will actually go through there, as well as we could have holes in other bones for ligament, tendon, all kinds of things, okay? We could also have um, depressions on a, on, a, on a bone because it's allows in the formation of a joint. In other words, if I have a joint, I don't want a joint that's perfectly flat like that because it's not very stable. I might want to have something that fits inside of a, of a trough or a hole or a socket like we see in the hip or in the shoulder a little bit, okay? So we have these depressions that actually um, uh, allow things to pass through them, uh, allow things to run through them, or actually helps in the, in the formation of joints. So let's talk about what some of these individual depressions or openings are. First one we have is called a fissure, okay? A fissure is just like what it sounds like. If you look at a fissure, now if you watched uh, you know, an earthquake movie, all of a sudden the earth breaks open and it has a big crack in it. A crack is called a fissure. So a fissure is a narrow slit between adjacent parts of bones. And again, what's going through there? blood vessels, nerves, or whatever the case may be. Uh, a typical example of this is so just looking at the skull, if looking at the skull, up in here, you see right here, and you see right here, see that black line? I, let me get, get rid of that one right there. That's not a good, good representation. See that little black line right there? There's another black line right there. There's actually another part of it that comes down this way. And you can't see it here, it comes down this way. That's called the superior orbital fissure. Orbital means eye. We talked about that before. It's a word you should know. It's a superior orbital fissure. Uh, just for your information, the eye, okay, um, has six muscles to it, okay? One on the top, one on the bottom, one on the side, one uh, on the other side, and then two of them that come obliquely. They actually go through a sling. That rotate the eye. I only have six eye muscles. Six eye muscles that make my eyes go in different directions. There are three nerves that will supply those six eye muscles. Okay, uh, cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, and cranial nerve six. Where? How do they get from the brain? Okay, which cranial nerves start at the base of the brain? How do they get from the brain to the eye muscles? They go through here. Okay, they go through this crack, that superior orbital fissure. So again, now we have a nerve that goes through that superior orbital fissure or a crack in the bone that, that allows them to go to the, to the muscles of the eye to innervate those eye muscles. Okay, so that's a fissure.
A foramen. A foramen is a hole. Okay, this is the base of the skull. Look at all these. It says there's a frame in there, there's a frame in there, a frame in there, a frame in there. Uh, there's actually one that's there, which is for the jugular vein, frame in there, there. All these little frame and carotid arteries and stuff like that are all going through that. So a frame in means a hole, means a hole. Okay, it's a hole. This is called the frame in magnum right there. Magnum means big. That's where the spinal cord is going to come through this hole. The spinal cord is coming through this hole. Spinal cord coming through that little hole right there. And so that's what we see. Um, uh, so a foramen is a hole. And, and what goes through there? Blood vessels, nerves, or ligament pass through that particular hole. In the back of the eye, in the back of the orbit, okay, uh, when we go, if we went back to the, to the picture before, and unfortunately, PowerPoint videos don't let me go back. What happens if I look at the back of the eye, there's also a little hole back there, and that's called the optic foramen. And the optic foramen is where the optic nerve goes from the brain to the eye for vision, okay? This is, that should be not foramen. Let's, let me do this, okay? Let me get rid of this, okay? Let's... Foramen magnum. Now it's right. Now it's right. Okay. Foramen magnum. Foramen whole magnum big. Okay. There's also what's called the obturator foramen, which is basically in the pelvis. Okay. And we'll see that when we look at uh, the pelvic bones as well. It's where the pubic and the uh, pubic bone and the ischium come together and they create a whole hole. It's basically covered over by a membrane, but things actually go through that nerves and stuff like that will go through that. So a foramen, a foramen is a hole. A fossa. A fossa is a shallow depression. Okay, a shallow depression. Now, up on the upper right, that's the ulna. Okay, that's the ulna on the upper right. Okay, this is the ulna. Okay, and this is the proximal. This is the proximal ulna, all up in here. What happens on the front of the ulna, right here? There's a little little hook, and on the back of the ulna, there's another little hook like that. This area of the ulna, right here, right here, is called the olecranon process. Okay. This area, this little hook right here, is called the coronoid process. Coronoid process. Okay. Well, think about that. If I have a little hook, and, and this is where the this is the humerus is going to fit in this little depression right here. The humerus fits in this little depression. Okay. What happens if I flex my elbow? If I bring my elbow up this way? Okay. What's going to happen is this little part right here, okay, is going to hit against the front of the humerus, but doesn't. Because in the front of the humerus, right here, there's a little depression. So when I flex my elbow up, that little bump, this little bump right here, fits in that little hole right there. Okay? And that's called the coronoid fossa. The coronoid fossa. This bump right here is called the olecranon. Okay? The olecranon, this whole hairy right here is the olecranon. And this is the olecranon process right there. When I extend my elbow, that has to go somewhere. Where does it go? It fits in this little fossa or depression inside there called the olecranon fossa. So a fossa is sort of like a shallow depression or a trench. And it just allows when we move one bone against the other, uh, a bump or lump on one bone could actually fit in a small little depression somewhere else. So here's my coronoid fossa. Here's my olecranon fossa. Coronoid fossa for this bump, olecranon fossa for this area right in there. Okay, And that's called a fossa. Sulcus. A sulcus is really a groove. Okay. Now this is the head of the humerus. This is the upper arm. Okay. Uh, this would be towards the scap that would be here. This is going to be medial. This is going to be lateral. Okay. So medial this way, lateral that way. And what happens is when I flex my elbow this way, okay, when I flex my elbow this way, uh, a couple muscles do that. One, the, the probably the, the stronger muscle is called the brachialis. It's a very strong muscle. It's very deep. But the other muscle we always talk about is called the biceps brachii. The biceps brachii not only not only I am going to go the right way. Not only flexes my elbow, but also raises my shoulder this way a little bit. Has a long tendon. Okay, and that long tendon. Okay, that long tendon fits right inside this groove. So a sulcus is a groove is a groove, okay? And again, it accommodates a blood vessel, a uh, nerve, or a tendon. So this is called the bicipital groove or bicipital sulcus or intertubercular sulcus because this is called a tubercle. That's a tubercle. It's a little bump. And, and basically, so that's called the intertubercular sulcus of the humerus. And because it is a groove, it's a trough. The bone comes up this way. There's a trough. comes this way. That tendon would fit right inside there. and allows that tendon to slide up and down in this direction, it parades, provides a little route for that tendon to go up and down inside that sulcus. So that's called a sulcus.
Now let's talk about some depressions or openings, okay? Depressions or openings, uh, again, okay? Another one is what we have is called a meatus, okay? Another depression or opening. We've talked about depressions. Let's talk about another one. And a meatus is a tube-like opening. Now this is the side of the skull, okay? This would be the eye up in here. Here's the back of the skull back in here. Right here, there's a hole, okay? And this is called the external auditory meatus of the temporal bone, okay? This area, this bone right here, if you see there's a little suture line right there, it comes like this. That's the temporal bone that sits right in there, okay? This would be the parietal bone. This is the temporal bone right there. Sphenoid bone sits in here, okay? Frontal bone sits right there, which you'll see about in the skull. But if you take your finger, okay, take your little finger, stick it like this. Now stick it in your ear. I can't because I have my headphones on. Stick it in your ear. Guess where it's at? It's in the external auditory meatus because the meatus is a tube-like opening, is a tube-like opening, okay? And that's what a meatus is, tube-like opening. Let's talk now and change gears just a little bit and get away from these uh, depressions and openings. And let's talk about surface markings that are sticking out, outies as compared to innies, okay? And these are called processes, okay? And processes are projections or outgrowths uh, that uh, from a bone that may form a joint or for some attachment of some tissues or something like that ligament or tendon or something like that and we have a number of different names for these processes so let's start on those right away let's talk first about a condyle now this is the femur okay this is the femur okay and this is the distal femur so everybody should know what distal femur is okay you know that and what happens if you look at the distal femur there's a round area here there's a round area here Round area here, round area here. These are long, so a condyle is a large round protuberance at the end of the bone, okay? I bet you if I was to say, hey, draw me a bone, okay, on a piece of paper for extra credit, I'm not gonna do that, okay, it's too simple. You draw something like this. Why is that bad? Guess what? That's a condyle, that's a condyle, that's a condyle, that's a condyle. Those little round surfaces at the end are called condyles. And they just allow, the, uh, on the other side in the, in the knee, there'll be a little meniscus or a little cartilage that actually cups around there that allows that condyle, that round protuberance to sit inside a little bit of a socket, okay? So a condyle is a large round protuberance at the end of a bone, okay? And this is, a, we'll, we'll find these in various bones. Femur is a great place, a facet. This is one that's a little bit difficult to see. The vertebrae, this is a vertebrae, this is a, a, a lumbar vertebrae, and this is the body. And what happens is they have one body of a vertebrae stacked on top of another body and stacked upon another body. But you know, it's like taking blocks and putting one block on top of another block on top of another block. It's not very stable. So what happens is on the outside, this is called the vertebral arch. It comes in here. Right in here, there's a flat surface, mild, well, actually mildly concave. Okay, on this side, and there's one on the bottom side. There's be one on the bottom side just below that, and these actually articulate, form a joint with the vertebrae above with this one, and the vertebrae below with the one below that. Okay, and that's called it's a, usually a relatively flat articular surface that actually provides increased stability. Okay, they are able to slide. Flat surfaces are able to rotate and slide a little bit on a flat surface, but they can't rotate. You know, like like a ball in a socket and that's called a facet okay so that's called a facet there's a so that's a facet right there and that's vertebral facet right there okay and there'll be ones on the opposite side for the for the vertebrae below just below that okay head head is exactly what it sounds like that's the head right there it's the rounded articular pro projection and supported on a on, ooh, on a neck Okay, here's my neck, there's my head, my head's round, my neck is a little bit narrower, okay, pencil neck. And so anyway, what happens is this area right here is the neck, and this area right here is the head. So the head is a rounded portion that actually sits on the neck. This is the femur, okay, and this is the, this is the proximal femur, and this round area sits actually in a socket in the pelvis, which is called the acetabulum, which is a word that will come up later on. It fits in a, in a, in a, a socket uh, in the femur called the acetabulum, and it's round. So, which, which means that now if I have a ball, it's called a ball and socket joint, so that, that ball can move in multiple different directions, which is a very, very mobile type of a joint, okay? That's called the head, a crest. Now, this is the pelvis, okay? And this area right here is called the iliac 
crest. A crest is a prominent ridge or a long proportion. You know, we find that if you feel the front of your shin, there'll be a very sharp piece of bone right down the front of the shin, and that's called the anterior tibial crest because that's the tibia. But this is that ridge. If you take your hands and feel the size of your, you know, a lower portion of your abdomen on the sides and the hip, you'll feel that little ridge of bone, and that's that bone which is called the iliac crest. It has little bumps on there. That's called the A. SIS or anterior superior iliac spine, and it's called the AIIS anterior in, inferior iliac spine. But we're talking here that area would be called the crest. Okay, it's a prominent ridge or elongated projection. Okay, epicondyle. Well, if this is the condyle down here, if this is the condyle down here, epi means what? Means upon. So this area right here, let me do a different color. This area right here. This area right here, which would be this area, this area here, this area right here, and this area right here, which is upon the condyle, is called the epicondyle. This is a great place for attachment of muscle. If we talk about the elbow, if you ever have a tennis elbow, okay, what happens on the lateral side of the humerus here at this point, it's hard to see. The lateral side of the humerus is easy if we we're in lab or something like that. On the lateral side of the humerus here is basically the muscles that bring my wrist back attached right here. You can try this yourself. If you take and you put, feel the lateral side of the humerus or just a little bit of the elbow on the lateral side of the arm and you pull your hand backwards like this, you can actually feel those muscles get tighter. That's called the lateral humeral epicondyle. And when people have a tennis elbow, the, the tendon right there or where the muscle attached becomes inflamed. If you take and you put your hand this way, okay, let me go this way. If you go this way with your hand, you feel on the medial side, that's the medial humeral epicondyle. And that's where those muscles attach. That's that little leaguer's elbow that they get it there. But anyway, the epicondyle is the area that's upon the condyle. And if this is the condyle, the area upon the condyle, here's the epicondyle. Epicondyle, epicondyle, epicondyle. Okay? So that's a word you should know. Epicondyle. Line. What a line is, is it's a small, it's a, it's a, maybe a crest wannabe. Okay, it's a, a long, narrow ridge on a bone. Now, it's sort of difficult to see here, but if you look right here, there's an area. This is the this is the this is the back side of the posterior side of the femur. Okay, and right here, there's a ridge of bone. Let me get rid of that so you can actually see what I'm talking about right now. Okay, and you can see see how there's like a little ridge of bone that comes out there, and that's called the linea aspera. The linea aspera. So that linea aspera is that area right there, that linea aspera, okay, which is a line. And actually what happens is there's a, a band of tissue that attaches there that divides the hamstrings on the medial side from the hamstrings on the lateral side, okay. On the back of the tibia, so here's the tibia, here's the tibia, okay. On the back of the tibia, there's a little line. You can actually see right where that where that little arrow comes to. If I could if I could just draw it, let me, with little dotted lines. Comes on That's called the soleal line, and what it means is uh, that's a line of attachment of, of where the soleus muscle, which is one of the calf muscles, attaches right by that area. Okay, so that's called the soleal line. Okay, so a line is a very long, narrow ridge uh, on a bone. Um, could be, and it's usually at the area where there's a border of something that attaches to it, such as some fascia that attaches here or muscle that attaches right there. Spinous process. Is a spinous process. When you feel your back, you feel those lumps and bumps on the back. Those are vertebral spinous processes. A spinous process is a sharp, very slender projection that extends backwards from the vertebra. So this would be anterior up in here. This is posterior here, and that's that little bump you feel on the back. It's called a spinous process. Okay, so that's a spinous process. Trochanter. A trochanter is a very large projection. Now this is again another femur we have here. This is a proximal femur. Proximal. Here's the head. Here's the neck that we talked about before. And there's a couple bumps right there. And that ring right there is called the greater trochanter. Greater trochanter. If you feel the lateral side of your hips down below that iliac crest a couple inches, you'll feel a bump. And that's what you're feeling. You're feeling this area right here, that greater trochanter, which is a site of muscle attachment. Uh, along the back, there's a crest of bone that comes this way. And then right here, there's a smaller bump. So this is the greater trochanter. Guess what they call this one? The lesser trochanter, because it's smaller. Lesser, smaller, greater, bigger, okay? But a trochanter is a very large projection on a bone, okay? A tubercle. A tubercle is also a projection, it's a bump, okay? Now, this right here is called the tibial tubercle. We talked about the patella. The patella is gonna be sitting right up in here, that sesamoid bone, and it's gonna attach the tibia with the 
patellar tendon that comes right down here. And where is it attached to? It attaches that tibial tubercle. Now, if you feel your knee and you feel the patella, now go down a couple inches below that. And you're going to feel a little bump on the front of the, of the tibia. That's the tibial tubercle. And that's where that patellar tendon will attach to. Okay? So that's that. Uh, if we look at the humerus, okay, we talked about that, that groove or that sulcus that was right there for the biceps tendon that runs in there. There's a bump here and a bump here between that sulcus. This is called the greater tubercle. Guess what they call that one? The smaller. Of course, the lesser. The lesser tubercle. This sits right there. So a tubercle is a smaller round of projection. It's not nearly the size of a trochanter. A tuberosity is a large, rounded, usually roughened area. Now, this is the pelvis. Remember we talked about the obturator foramen before? That's the obturator foramen right there. That's that big hole. This bone right here would be called the pubis. This down, bone down here is called the ischium. Okay. And this area right here is called the ischial tuberosity. Ischial tuberosity. The hamstrings muscles actually attach to the bottom of that ischial tuberosity right there. Okay. So it's usually large, round. It's very rough. If you were to look at it uh, and you can actually feel it on, on a bone, it would be very rough appearance. And why? It has little, little small little di depressions in it, little dents in that. And that's where the muscle could attach deeper inside those little areas. So that's a tuberosity is a large, rounded, uh, a usually roughened area on the bottom of a bone. Okay. That's called a tuberosity. Now, there are a couple other words that you might encounter as time goes down. A notch, okay? Um, when you talk about the scapula, that's probably, probably the most classical area of a notch. The scapula has a couple little areas in that that actually are notched out. And notch would be a little bit of an area where the bone comes this way and it comes down like this. And that, yeah. Also, the pelvis. The pelvis has what's called the greater and the lesser sciatic notch. Okay, on the back. And basically, they're little scalloped areas on the bone. Actually, not little. They could be somewhat big. So a notch is sort of like a little, a little cut out area. It's, it's, it's not like a sulcus. A sulcus usually has a long trough. This is just a rounded area so something could pass through that area, but it's not long. It's just a short, it's a, generally the thickness of bone. That's about it. Another word that you might see is a groove. Okay, a groove is the same as a, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Oh man, that was bad. A groove is the same as a sulcus, same as a sulcus. A ramus means a bar. Now, if you go back to the, um, the pelvis in the previous, uh, when we talked about the ischial tuberosity, what happens is where the ischium, the bottom where that tuberosity meets the pubis, it creates a bar-like piece of bone, and that is called a ramus. That's called a ramus. A ramus is a bar bone. At the top, the pubis meets the ilium, which is the upper portion, and it creates a bar on the top of that obturator foramen, and that would be called the pubic ramus, the pubic ramus, okay, ramus. If you see the word eminence, eminence just means a lump or bump on a bone, okay? If you see the word ridge, ridge is sort of like a, a cross between a line and a, and a crest, OK, sometimes it might be thought of a, a little bit bigger than a line, but a little bit smaller than a crest. OK, and that's just called a ridge. OK, a ridge, a ridge, a trochlea means spool shape. Now, where this makes a difference, OK, is when we look at the at the uh, uh, humerus, the humerus has a, has one spool shaped articulation. It's not going to show here has a spool shaped art articulation. Let me do it this way with this. A spool shaped articulation. The articulation comes down like this. It looks like a little spool. There's a little rounded area right next to it. And this area that looks like a spool, if I drew the other part of the spool, which is not really there, it would be like that. And so this area, it's very spool shaped, and that's called the trochlea. The trochlea, a uh, trochlear process of the of the of the of the humerus. So trochlea means something that's spool shaped. Okay, and the last word I want to mention here is body. Body means a major portion of something. Okay, and a major portion of the bone. If I look at that verte vertebrae, that big hard solid portion, the major portion is called the vertebral body. Uh, if I look at the uh, if I look at the pelvis, uh, the body of the pelvis would be the the larger portion of that ilium, the bigger wing portion. Okay, if I look at the sternum, the bigger portion, the middle portion of the sternum is called the body. Okay, so that would be the major portion of a particular bone. Okay, and I think that those are some words that you should also know as well as the ones we talked about previously. 
Now, these are words that are, are are essential for you to know, just like I've given you a whole long word list. Maybe you want, might want to, you know, uh, write these down somewhere so you can remember these words, because these words come up all the time. Um, and for you, um, should you should you get through our, uh, the, our, uh, our X-ray tech program, what's going to happen is these are words that are, are thrown around every single day. Every single day, uh, directional terms, regional terms, uh, lumps and bumps, depressions. These are words that are not off out of the ordinary, but they're very regular appearing words. OK, so I think that these are words that you do need to know that you do need to uh, not just think about. They should become second nature to you. OK, so we've given you a whole long list of words today, as well as body parts diaphysis metaphysis all these things these are words every word that we've talked about so far osseous wise is a word that is essential for you to know not just you should be wake up in the middle of the night screaming these things and your hands flaying and saying hey all night long you were saying trochlea you know i mean that's fine that'd be great i'd be happy if i could hear that what happens these are words that you that you need to know that they're essential words to be able to do your job so please sit down learn these words understand what they are i think the pictures are pretty self-explanatory in regards to what it is you got them here we'll do webex we'll do uh um now they're on the powerpoints as well so please go over these again and uh these are words that you that you definitely need to know okay as always if you have any questions you could always uh email me and ask me or ask me during a conference or whatever the case may be um um, I just shoot me an email and I'll be more than happy to try to explain something a little further. But if no other questions, uh, or if no, well, you're not going to have questions here because there's a video. You're not going to, you can't call in on the video. But anyway, if you do have any questions, make sure you contact me. No question goes unanswered. Um, and uh, if, if um, uh, at this point, hopefully these things will, will, become second nature to you um and i and uh, otherwise i want you to be safe and uh, be healthy and we'll talk to you uh, at our next video